Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're so glad to have you. And as somebody who has been working on this event for, I don't know, four months, <laughs> it's really good to finally see all of you in one, one place. Uh, I would just like to really quickly uh, introduce myself and our program this evening. My name is Rebecca Phillips. I've been communicating with a lot of you, especially if you are uh, affiliates in the area. And I work at uh, the Freedom Foundation as our Student Freedom Project Coordinator. Uh, and basically what that means is I, I coordinate outreach programs specifically for college students. Uh, but we had a bigger vision for this event than just a student audience, although we have lots of students students here with us tonight. Um, so I took a, a little bit of a step outside of some of my usual tasks to work on this event, and it's been a really wonderful experience. Uh, I, we found out about Greg uh, a few months ago, back in November. Uh, I heard him speak at a conference I was attending, and uh, his story was really inspiring, and I thought, we need to, to bring him out here to Washington State and have him speak um, to, to people in, in our area. And so that's how I found out about Greg, and, and he was gracious enough to accept our invitation, and it's a pleasure to be hosting him tonight. Uh, the best part, one of the best parts of planning this event has been getting to know the CrossFit community. Obviously, many of you who do CrossFit know that uh, it's a very rigorous fitness regimen, but it's also a very strong and vibrant community of people. Um, it's a group of people who share the same ideal. Um, they want to make themselves the best possible versions of themselves that they can be. And it's really not all that different uh, from what the Freedom Foundation is doing in the realm of public policy. Uh, just like CrossFit does with fitness, we want to help create an economic environment that is full of unique opportunities uh, for people to be free to be the most excellent versions of themselves that they can be. And we believe that strengthening our free enterprise system is one of the best ways to do that because it gives people maximum opportunity, maximum choices, maximum happiness. Uh, because at the end of the day, public policy is not just about facts and figures and laws that get put down on paper. It's about people uh, and people who want to um, achieve their own successes in life and people who have uh, opportunities and dreams and passions that they want to pursue. And we want Washington to be a place where people can do that in areas like business, in areas like government, in personal endeavors. Um, as students, uh, we want you to be able to be the best versions of yourselves that you can be and to have all the opportunity that you can possibly imagine. So we hope that we get to know all of you a little bit better in the days following this event. And we really hope that um, Greg's story uh, tonight, tonight and his message for you will, will be inspiring um, and, uh, and will motivate you as you leave here tonight. Um, but first, while I have your attention, my 15 seconds <laughs> of fame, um, we would like to get your photo. So uh, one of my coworkers here uh, is going to be taking your photo. So quick, fix your hair. <laughs> Smile real pretty. <laughs> um, and this photo is going up right now, well, momentarily, <laughs> um, on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash myfreedomfoundation. Go there, tag yourself, uh, and let us know that you were here. Um, also, if you are uh, active on Twitter, you're welcome to share your thoughts about this event and live tweet with us using the hashtag be better period. That's hashtag be better period. So we're gonna be live tweeting. We invite you to do the same. And, uh, and we're looking forward to, uh, to getting to know all of you later in the coming days. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Greg Glassman. Can you hear me? In the back, hands? Awesome. 
Good evening. I want to thank the Freedom Foundation for putting this together. Thank you, Rebecca, the staff. Is excellent. Um, you're doing good work. I think it's important work. I want to thank the University of Washington for, for uh, having us here. Is that better or worse? Better. All right, good. Uh, CrossFitters, affiliates, thank you. Thank you for coming. Who here is a CrossFitter? Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right, three, two, one, go, right? <laughs> Lock the doors, we're doing Fran. <laughs> wow. I'm going to tell you your story. You want to hear it? <laughs> I uh, was an employee in a commercial gym system in Southern California. Gold, predominantly. Spent a lot of years working for Gold's Gym. And uh, I learned a lot there. I had a lot of fun there. I had a rip-snorting clientele. I was about as busy as a, as a trainer could be. But uh, from the start, from the early days as a teenager, um, I had a sneaky suspicion that the people in the gym were fundamentally doing everything wrong. Now, hey, yeah, that's kind of bold, huh? I, I didn't quite have the balls to say it. But uh, I certainly thought it. And I, I found it interesting that it took a, a, an acre of equipment to um, produce a variant of fitness that, though it was striking in the appearance, it was significantly limited in, in, in the function that it yielded. So you might have some of the biggest legs and chest anyone's ever seen. But it's kind of weird to me that I ask you to jump on a 20-inch box and on jumping on on the first rep, you tear your ACL. It's kind of weird, you know? And you throw like a girl and you can't run at all, but you look kind of cool, kind of trippy, right? <laughs> it's, it's certainly intimidating. I mean, it's sometimes even hard to pose and it's hard to even watch. And then the women were just outright disgusting, right? <laughs> But it was fun. I mean, it was a, it was a neat place because there were a lot of normal people that came in, a lot of firemen, a lot of cops. I inherited that crew early. I became the fireman and cop guy. I was a young guy, the young buck, had a gymnastics background, not a build, bodybuilding background. So I got the, I didn't get the movie stars and, and celebrities and pro athletes so much, but I got a lot of firemen and cops, and they had a, they had a critical fitness need. And it was, it was a functional need. And they had to do, cops had to do cop things, and the firemen had to do firemen things. And what was interesting about the things that they had to do was that they were uh, uh, really hard to map out in terms of just what the, the requirements may be in, a, in dire circumstances. And it wasn't, like, it wasn't like the needs of an athlete. Cool thing about being an athlete is you know when the season starts, you know when it ends. You know how many meets, games, matches, uh, you know, that your that you fights, whatever it is that you're going to have. You know who the opponent is. You know what time the event's going to start. You know all the rules. It's just, it's marked physiologically more by what's known than what isn't known. But you talk to a cop and it's like, you need to be strong? Yes. Was well, that more important than endurance? Well, it depends. Is endurance important? Yes. Is that more important than strength, power, or speed? Well, perhaps, but I don't know. It depends on the circumstance. And at the end of the day, it didn't take much imagination to come to the understanding that these people had to be ready for the unknown and the unknowable. They had to be ready for just about anything. They had to be ready for everything to some extent. And that, that kind of fit with me, because I, I was a trippy cat. I was a gymnast that discovered very early in my gymnastics career that I could get world-class strong. I was a good gymnast, but not a great one. A good one, but not a great one. But I was one of the strongest gymnasts in the world. And I did it with dumbbells. That was my secret. And it was a, a crazy secret. And one of the first great secrets that I learned, it was impossible to share. No matter how many people you told, they'd say, how in the hell did you get so strong? They'd say, with dumbbells. They'd go, oh. as if I had told them that it was you know, molesting children or something. I mean, it was, <laughs> it just, there's just it, nothing. It never went anywhere. But that was the answer, with dumbbells. Some would go, how, what do you mean with dumbbells? I go, well, you want to do a planche. I just hold them out like this, right? So I'd take a pair of dumbbells and lower them down to here. 
and then drive them back up. And I weighed 150 pounds when I could do that with a pair of 75 pound dumbbells. I got on the rings, I could hold the planche, and I could press out of it. There. Yeah, okay. Then they'd go ask someone else, how do you get so strong? No one wanted to, not to hear, hear the answer. But I was a gymnast that had, a, had discovered something wonderful about weight training. And I had a penchant for the bicycle that later turned into an obsession. And as I, as I got older, I became a good gymnast, a reasonable cyclist. Here was, here was my line on cycling. If you didn't ride bikes all the time, I'd crush you. I didn't care what you did or where you came from or how fat, fast you were. If you didn't ride all the time, I was going to beat you. Why? Because I rode all the time. I didn't have a car for 15 years. I rode my bike everywhere. As a trainer, I rode my bike. Nine miles to work in the rain, nine miles back at home again in the dark. Did that for, for 10, 15 years. Now, I knew a lot of gymnasts that were better gymnasts than I was. And I knew cyclists that were better cyclists than I was. And I know people that lifted weights that were stronger under the weight pile than I was. But the funny thing is that if you could edge me out, even edge me out, at any one of those three, I'd crush you at the other two. Crush you. And then if we went to go try something new, like jujitsu or surf, it was like I'd been doing it a long time. Already, early. I mean, just really fast, learn quickly. The gymnastics was a lot of that. But the thing that really mattered was that there was a blended capacity in the cross-training that was bike ride, gymnastics, and, and, and weight lift, weight train, that developed a fitness that gave me a considerable advantage in all kinds of other activities, especially new stuff. And this is a fun thing to test. Now, let me, let me tell you the history of some of these workouts, since you, everyone here is a CrossFitter. Um, <laughs> Uh, the gymnastic season goes like this. Early in the year, you're learning new tricks. You have an idea of what you'd like to do is when the season starts and a routine that you'd like to do. And so you've, you kind of imagine the routine. You put the tricks in it together. The problem is, is though you can't do half the tricks that you'd like to see in your cool routine for this year. And so what do you do? You commit a tremendous effort into acquiring those tricks. And somewhere at about the halfway mark in the season, you will find that you've got the five, six, seven pieces, elements that you need to build your routine. And you're proud of that. You can do a cross, you can do a double full twisted dismount, it's all there, it's all good. But when you try to put them all together into a routine, a funny thing happens. And it feels like 200 beats a minute, and you vomit. And it only took about two minutes to get that messed up. Sound familiar? <laughs> And there was no amount of riding your bike that would get you ready for it. There was no amount of working these tricks individually that would get you there. There was no, nothing you could really do under the weight pile that would seem to get you there. Certainly not the instructions that came with my Sears Roebuck Company Ted Williams weight set. This guy was doing like this. Yeah, and things like this, right? And I'd try some of that and I'm like, you know what? This is not what a routine feels like on the rings of the parallel bars. It was nothing like this. And so I thought, well, what would happen if I put the 95 pounds on the bar? See, that's why it was a 110 pound weight set. I put 95 pounds on the bar and figured out that this motion, done repeatedly, started to have some of that feel that was a, a <laughs> gymnastics workout. Yeah, that's the part. That's the yucky part. And if you did, say, 21 of these, and then went over to the Voigt pull-up bar in the doorway. Anyone, did my, anyone resonate there? Any old folks in the audience? Remember that thing? It had the rubber ends on it, and you could open it up. And we discovered early that if you pulled the rubber ends off and opened it up until it was about an inch and a half on each end wider than the jam, it was kind of a permanent installation. <laughs> And safe. I had friends that broke their arms doing dismounts on those bars when they pulled out of the wall. That's, you know, talk about home spawn. So it's 21 thrusters with 95 pounds, 21 pull-ups. Let's do 15 of each, 9 of each. That felt like, right? And then the second one I do, you've got to time this thing, because that was horrible. And, and it was actually in the second iteration that I put the watch to it. But between the first and the second, I went across the street and got my buddy who was a pommel horse guy. I grew up in a neighborhood of gymnasts in a, 
in the, in the, in the, in the uh, fallout, of what, which was a, just an amazing experience in physical culture, experiment in physical culture. The LA Unified School District decided in 1926 that every high school in the district would have a men's and a women's, a boys and a girls gymnastics team. And that program in a 45, 50 year period produced scores of Olympic athletes generating a dozen or more Olympic medals in the sport of gymnastics, all from one high school system. Um, I was uh, in, in just behind a group of gymnasts that included one uh, named Steve Hug, who in 1968, I graduated in 74, this kid in 1968, he was four years my senior, um, in 1968, at Mexico City, he was the number one gymnast in the, in the United States. He was also a 16-year-old 10th grader at the high school. He was the best gymnast in high school. He was the best gymnast in college. He was the best gymnast in the United States. And he was from my neighborhood, and he was a self-taught local kid that learned what he learned in the parks on substandard, inferior metal equipment, metal rings, metal parallel bars in a culture, in a community where we would stand in line in, park, in the park with our chalk waiting to get onto the rings as sixth graders, seventh graders, and eighth graders because the possibility was that you might go to the Olympics and be the best gymnast in the world with just three or four years, right? <laughs> you know, he, he did it. <laughs> I watched people trying to get fit by working strength on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and working endurance Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So they would do the lateral raises and the curls and the leg extensions and the calf raises on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, they would jog in their target heart range. <laughs> also burns a lot of fat, I was told. It's amazing how much muscle it burns. And what happened was that, indeed, you develop a bodybuilder's physique. You can do that on three days a week. You get nice biceps and delts and all that glute ham tie and all that silly stuff, right? Um, and you're also pretty good at running uh, moderate distances at a moderate pace, at a, at a casual pace. And I even would run across on occasion, I remember a gentleman that we met from a Kern County Sheriff's Office at their academy and instructor who in training in this manner had actually developed a uh, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of a five minute mile and about a 400 pound bench press. And he was widely acknowledged within the community of, of uh, academy directors of the 19 academies in the state of California, police academies, as being the fittest of the instructional staff at this big event. So I thought, wow, that's pretty good. I mean, that's better than most people will do with a segmented training model to develop a 400-pound bench press. That's indeed impressive, and a five-minute mile is pretty good. That's good stuff, right? And to have that in one individual is really impressive because the overwhelming majority of people with a 400-pound bench press couldn't run out of the building to save their lives, and <laughs> et cetera. Um, so I thought, well, let's try this with the guy. Let's put let's put 135 pounds on the bar and then let's have them do 21 reps and then run 400 meters and let's do like six rounds of this. And we must have sat with him for about two or three hours debating whether we should call 911 or not. I mean it was, <laughs> he was throwing up everything and then he was throwing up nothing and it was, it was and he just kept throwing up. He was on his hands and knees. I mean it was bad. It was a, it extended the day several hours while we just watched this poor guy. And, and he couldn't believe it, and no one, neither could anyone else. But what had happened was that his segmented training had developed a segmented capacity. And when we blended these elements into a distinct workout that took elements from which he would appear to have been strong when combined into something, something in, in, in its blend, he had nothing. He had nothing. And everyone present knew what that, what, what that suggested. It was clear. It was clear. That first of all, look, there's, and there's other things wrong with it than just that it's segmented. I'm speaking to the choir here, but I'll share something else with you. What is that, what is that workout marked by? Low intensity, low power output. 
The isolation movements Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, those are not moving large loads long distances quickly. I do not have significant force moving significant, displaced significant distance, and it is not done in, in any appreciably quick manner. It's light, it's short moving, and it's slow. It's low power output, it's low intensity. So is running in your target heart rate, your target zone, your fat burning zone. In net, what you have is a, is a, is a, a workout that is designed to elicit um, a, a low work capacity, low power output across uh, fairly narrow time and mortal domains. It's almost the antithesis of the CrossFit definition of fitness, which for the choir is work capacity measured across broad time and mortal domains. That is, how much power can you exert in short duration doing a bunch of things, in moderate duration doing a bunch of things, and at long distance, in long duration, doing a bunch of things. We gave to the world a, a model for fitness that was amenable to, to precise and accurate estimation. That was, that was new. It was a significant contribution. But let me tell you something. Much of that, except for the final formulation of work capacity measured across broad time and modal domains, but the rest of it, the idea of workouts like this, these, this idea of quantifying workouts, the idea that coming out of the gym saying, hey, I got my swole on more than you, I must be getting fitter, is not the same as I just beat your ass because I did uh, you know, 400 more foot pounds um, per, per 10 minutes than you did. We gave to the world a workout that we could be quantified. And so now that it is, when we said three, two, one, go, we could thereafter, when the clock stops, say first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way down to DFL. And that was new. But this languished in the commercial gym environment for about two decades, growing to several significant figures at a rate of zero. <laughs> You like that, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> you know why? Because I was as busy as I could be. There was nothing I could do to leverage the effort. Now, amongst the problems was that I was in a commercial gym doing one-on-one -on -one training. And, and uh, uh, the other thing was that in this commercial environment, um, I couldn't do all the things I wanted to do. There were a number of things that, that weren't, weren't perfect about it. But the, the biggest difference really was one of mindset because something really cool happened. Now let me just take another little jump. To you. In LA, I would find my training successful in a gym. I'd come in and they'd want, I want you at this Gold's gym. It's not like, gonna be like the other Gold's gyms. Can you bring all your people? Oh yeah, I'll bring them. God, oh, this is perfect. We're gonna, you know. They'd get my people on their books, on their membership, and then I would, what the last gym owner I, I worked uh, with as, a, as a, a contractor, he showed me in a graph, he says, look, you're a great trainer, but you've submarined my training program. And so what happened was I was in the gym charging about twice what his trainers were that were on payroll. I was a contractor. They were going to take a third of my income. And it was, was the contract, but I was charging 2x the going rate. I had the owner of the gym, her wife, she worked with Jack Lane for years, tell me, I know this industry and I know it well. You'll never get what you're asking. Two years later, you have to go because you've destroyed our program, charging twice what everyone else is with just you and two trainers. So I go out on my own because I was out of places to go. See, in the LA market, you could every two years find a new gym and play that game forever. You'd have to live 4,000 years before you'd run out of gyms. <laughs> and, and so now I found myself in Santa Cruz, and four years later, I'm screwed. I don't have a place to go. And so jujitsu school, jujitsu client rescued me, said, you come train with me, you best in the world, of course they hate you. You train my gym. And there it was. My affair with the Brazilians began. And uh, some people know what that meant. Um, it was a great experience. I learned a lot. I met the best uh, uh, MMA uh, uh, practitioners, uh, uh, competitors in the world. And uh, we, we made a big difference in short order. But uh, that relationship uh, went like so many. Here, here's what happened in the jiu-jitsu school. The head of the jiu-jitsu school told me that I was scaring off the jiu-jitsu clients because they saw us working out and they thought they were going to have to do that. <laughs> I'm like, really? They're afraid? They want to do jiu-jitsu, but they're afraid of the guys on the row. He goes, yeah, they think I'm going to make them do that. And so you have to go. So I got my own spot. Um, 
I was, I was, you know, it wasn't something I wanted to do. I didn't want to get thrown out of another place. And this is the guy that rescued me from the other places, you know? I must be a real because I keep getting thrown out of everywhere I go. I got the same old clients. They follow me everywhere, but, you know, like I run afoul of the gym owners. Not, I've never had a bad relationship with a client. It's just with these gym owners. Then here I am. I'm out of places to go. There was, was one place left to go, and he said, come, I want you here, and it was Dave Draper. And Dave Draper was the only bodybuilder on earth that liked me. And, and he actually, I was the only human being, I think, that ever got to train his wife, Larie. And he not only didn't mind, but he told people that I trained her. And that was such an amazing thing. And I was so proud of that. And I don't know if any of you know bodybuilding in old school, but he was like the guy, you know? He was Sharon Tate's trainer. I mean, he was a, just a good, good dude. And he says, come to my gym and train, with, train here. We'd love to have you. And I didn't do it. You know why? Because I knew two years later he was going to hate me because I was going to submarine his training program. And he didn't invite me into submarine his training program. He's just trying to be a good dude. So no, I decided I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go out and get my own place, my own box. And I didn't even know it was a box then. It was just a gym. And we started looking at places. And the uh, retail spaces had nothing for me. The ceilings were too low. I couldn't do what I wanted to do. By God, it's time to hang a rope, right? Something they were never going to let me do in a Gold's Gym anywhere. And other things. Um, all banned. <laughs> Serially, yeah, across LA and Santa Cruz. And so I got a little space at 2851 Research Park Drive in Santa Cruz, California, Unit B. And it had roll up doors. And now I just roll those doors up and roll them down, turn the lights off, turn them on. I mean, it was cool. And got the equipment in there and set it up and put the dog bed under the stairwell. I mean, we're getting to go. Got the TV hooked up and the stereo hooked up. and. Uh, coffee pot going in the corner and all the gear in and there it was and I tell you what it was a crazy crazy thing because here I am I'm 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 not three miles from the jujitsu school it's the same effing equipment it's the same clients I'm unlocking the door the same way my Wednesday at nine o'clock is still my Wednesday at nine o'clock right I got a little more room not a lot more I'm in 1,250 square feet the Brazilian thing was interesting I was paying for a thousand feet and I said, well, I, I got 1,000 feet. And then one day I says, dude, how's this 1,000 feet? And we got out the tape measure, it was 400. Um, <laughs> so now I had 1,250 feet that actually we would add up that way if you multiplied length by width. And, uh, and, uh, I, but the, the bizarre thing is, you know what happened is I, I, I felt like I was a businessman. Isn't that weird? And why? Because, I mean, and I could, it felt weird to me. I was tripping. Why do I feel like a businessman now all of a sudden? But I don't know, because maybe I was paying the rent. And maybe because nobody could kick me out, although we learned that landlords can kick you out too. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot harder, but they can. Um, <laughs> cities can kick you out too, it turns out. <laughs> but let's don't go there. Why, you, why, why go there? Why do that? Um, but I felt completely different. I tell you what, I woke up and I looked in the mirror and I saw someone different. I'm looking at a businessman. That, that kind of scared me because I really didn't know what a businessman was. Um, and I'm doing the same thing. I'm training the same fools, right? I mean, it's us still doing the same stuff. Well, we've got a little better equipment now. But uh, so I, I thought, you know, I better go to the bookstore and get, get a book and learn about this business stuff. And, it's funny, I, I'm a failed academic, but I, I, was failed, I was a failed jack of all trades. So I majored in chemistry, I majored in physics, I majored in applied mathematics, did pretty well with that. Um, I went to literature and then got sick of the students and went back to math and then got sick of the lack of humanities and went to philosophy and got sick of the students and went back to the sciences and jumped around and finally decided I'd had enough of it all. But it was interesting, I had no academic experience with business at all, none. None. It was the one thing that I, I even had trouble imagining how it could be an academic enterprise. I'm still not sure, but I, I, I wondered at the time, and I never managed to go there. But here I was. I found myself in the big bookstore in Santa Cruz, and I went in there early one morning, shortly after it opening, and they had, they had three carols about six feet wide, about seven feet tall, loaded with the latest titles out of, the, out of some of the business schools. Everything was there, all the, all the good guys. And what was amazing is that I was going through book after book after book. And I'm pretty, I am pretty survey something pretty fast. I know how to look through a table of contents, flip through the index, try open a chapter somewhere, start digging through, go to the beginning. I'm making, I can tear up a book. You give me seven, eight minutes with it. I'll learn something from it. 
what I was getting, it was terrifying me. There was nothing in any of these books that was going to have any bearing on anything that I would ever do or would ever be willing to do or had any interest in doing. I thought it had anything to do with anything at all with training or the people who are coming through my doors or the business I was going to be in. Nothing. And fundamentally, I think what I was looking for is I wanted to find some book, something that would give me some insights on improving my product or service. Something. I found nothing. Tons on marketing, things I wouldn't do, didn't want to do, didn't believe would make a difference. And it was interesting because the thing that had driven me to the bookstore wasn't exactly that I just had opened a gym, is that shortly after opening the gym, I needed a bigger space. Once I got my own, you're your businessman. I was really good at business, apparently, because the gym just blew over. I mean, it popped up like, like the Jiffy Pop bag, right? And I had, I had clients telling me, dude, you need, they didn't call me coach, they called me dude. They said, dude, you need a bigger gym. I go, I know. And then I started hearing it a lot. And I'll tell you now, fellow affiliates, um, when you're told twice a week that you need a bigger box, you're losing money by not getting a bigger box, okay? People are telling you you need a bigger box, you're hurting yourself not getting it. If you hear that twice a week from someone, that, listen to me, you need a bigger box. When you get it like that, and they're telling you twice, but they're trying to tell you, is they're gonna quit coming soon. <laughs> it's too crowded, right? And so I made that, the checklist, you know how you do things, the pros and cons on any big fork in the road. What happens with the what ifs, you know, the good, the bad about making the decision. And so I, I dutifully made my checklist. And it was really interesting, the pros and cons of expansion. The pros are more space and the cons more rent, right? <laughs> Beyond that, there are a bunch of other kinds of intangibles. And when I held them up to the lens of, is this a good financial decision? Is this a good business decision? What I found that in bright and early in the morning, uh, early in the week, on a day that it wasn't raining when I was riding my bike in nine miles to work, um, I'd be in this upbeat kind of move, and then a whole bunch of this stuff would just check off positive, positive, yes, 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 these are all the great advantages of expansion, you gotta do it. And then a little later in the week, I might be pedal home nine miles in driving rain and you know, whatever else after training, being at the gym at 5 a.m. and on my home at 11 p.m., right? On my bike in the rain. Um, I'd look at the same list and it's, no, 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 it's all gonna fail, I'm gonna go broke. It, couldn't, it was mood dependent, the damn thing, and I don't think I'm a mood, but gee whiz, the pros and the cons, my decision making, it's completely split left, right, the fork in the road is a fork in the road that's there's the good mood, bad mood forks. I couldn't make intellectual sense of whether this was a sound business move or not. I'll tell you why, because markets are unknowable. But here's what I did. I backed up and I said, you know what, this is gonna make me nuts. What I want to do is I want to improve this training facility. I want this to be, it's already the best gym in the world. That was easy. Now it's going to be even better. And what I want to do is I want to do those things, do whatever I can to deliver the best product and service, the best gym, and the best training that you can get anywhere. What would I do? What, what does expansion suggest from that angle? Well, I can get mountain bikes. I can get the rest of the dumbbells I need. I can hang two more ropes. I've always been short on the concept two rowers. Cargo net in the middle. What else? Let's get a pommel horse and parallel bars. That would make a difference. And what would be the net effect of all of these changes? Positive, 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 positive. And it was clearly and obviously a positive. And I came up with the same list whether I was in a good mood or a bad mood. And at every turn, the list of things that looked like expansion was a list of things that made my gym better and quite a bit better. Quite a bit better. So I did that. Wondering if it was going to destroy me financially. Guess what happened? I needed a bigger box real soon after that. <laughs> they came, and they came in large numbers. What were they coming to? The better gym. The better gym. The improved gym. The best gym in the world just got a whole lot better. And they came in large numbers. Make an X on the, mar on the board anywhere. You are here. You know, you've seen that, right? Put a big dollar sign off to the left. There's the money. You're a businessman. You're supposed to chase money, right? That's what business does. Wrong. Off to the right, put a big E for excellence. Here's the reality. Markets are unknowable. You're going to shoot for the money. Every time you aim for it, you hit something else. You might even end up buying bars. 
it's a it's a it's it's an elusive target. You just you just don't know what's going to make money or not. The closest you'll come to it is this: is that excellence is the lighthouse. It is the beacon. It's always in the same place. Every time you look at it, regardless of the mood, you don't, you know, I don't know anything about hair salons. I went into Jose Bear's salon in, uh, in Beverly Hills, and I was like, man, this place is cool. <laughs> you know, I mean, of course he's a millionaire. Check out this place. It's crazy. The pride, the, the commitment, the cleanliness, the, just the, the whole atmosphere it just reeks of excellence. You ever been in a fantastic little diner? A great small bookstore, right? If you don't know those experiences, then don't, don't bother ever thinking about business. But if you know what I'm talking about, if you're like, yeah, I know what it looks like when you go into a diner and you go, wow, right? The excellence is just, it's, it, it is the lighthouse. Here's what free markets do. Here's what markets do unfree, just not with the same efficiency. They move capital to excellence. You do something excellent and markets will bring you money. And often, typically, generally, down paths through vehicles that were fairly much a surprise to you. That is an amazing opportunity to come out of this. I've had the wonderful, wonderful luxury of having had three or four billionaire clients that I spent a lot of time with. I'm talking about hundreds of hours riding bikes, traveling the world, and listening to them talk. And, and uh, none of my billionaires were after money. One of them found it a matter of personal gratification to write code that was better than code previously written. And for him, it was kind of proof that he was smarter than everyone else. <laughs> and serially, he was correct, and it made him a billionaire. But it wasn't about the money. And the interesting thing about one of these cats is he spent it all and then got it back, and then spent it all and then got it back. And he's in a spend it all phase right now. <laughs> but it's, it's about the excellence. It's about the blinding, the blind, relentless, indefatigable pursuit of a, of, a, of, a, of a crazy passion that looks to all the world like excellence. The best training program you've ever dreamed of. The best hamburger anyone's ever eaten. The best hair salon you could ever go to. You get it? And, and that's easy. It's easy to now. Now, can you, make, can you make stupid financial decisions in the pursuit of excellence? Oh, absolutely. But I want you to understand that the role of money is like the role of jet fuel to an airline. Do you need, do you need, do you need aviation fuel to run an airline? Yes. If your airline is doing very, very poorly, might you be using a uh, little fuel. Sure, you also might be using a lot. But what you find is that there will be a correlation between the fuel consumed and your success, but the fuel consumed is not in any way, shape, or form causal of your success. It's correlative. Money is the lubricant. What is, what is money? It's human potential energy. That's all it is. It's the thing with which I use to get people to do things that I want. Do the good things we want move in sync and league together to accomplish the ends we want. And you can't run a business without it. I can't run a business without money, and I can't grow a business without profit. But the pursuit of money will neither help you run a business or grow one. That's not what successful business people do. And I'm here to tell you that the Hollywood notion of the businessman is dead wrong. It's not what I'm seeing. Those aren't, and I've met, I've met some folks in business. Anthos. <laughs> yeah, those, go those Goldman Sachs and Ron Dirtbags. I mean, there are, there are bad people in business. There are. I've, I've, I've not met a lot of them. What I've met largely is people that have, have made a major contribution to, to, to something that makes their lives better. That's what I've met. And it's certainly true of my affiliates. It's certainly true of this program. And it's led staff and I to come to the conclusion that business is the art and science of creating uniquely attractive opportunities for other people. For my clients, the training that we offer is a uniquely attractive opportunity. I'm going to give you the opportunity to pay twice what you've ever paid for a gym membership before, but you're going to get three times the benefit you were getting before. 
So it's a savings. <laughs> Laugh all you want. That's exactly what's going on. <laughs> you write it costs twice as much. You're getting three times more. Oh, okay. <laughs> you are. Why are you laughing? Affiliates, is it not? Is this the truth? It's the truth. It's the truth. It's a steal. It's a steal. We treat employees that way. When an affiliate tells me, you got to stop this trainer, he left me and he's going right down the street to open a gym. You know what I hear? Why didn't you make it so that it never made sense for him or her to leave? Let me tell you who trained at my gym. Annie Sakamoto, Tony Budding, Nicole Carroll, Dave Castro. Pretty good team, right? Greg Amundsen, Eva T. Nobody ever left. I told them I'd kill them if they did. <laughs> we took 20% we took of what they made. And I knew damn well, because I've been on the other end of this thing forever, I knew that only a moron would leave a comfortable, productive, collegial environment with all the gear to go out on your own and think that you're going to keep 80% of, of, of what you pull in. You ain't going to do it. Collectively, we can do that. And we can build and we can scale this thing into something that provides an opportunity for everyone that, that wasn't available individually. And it was a uniquely attractive opportunity. Same for employees. You come to work for CrossFit, and yeah, the accountants say we pay people way too much money. That's because I don't want them to leave. I'm going to provide for them a uniquely attractive opportunity. You hear this? It's a spirit of giving. It's been that way all along. And every other notion about business, everything that Hollywood portrays of the CEO being some kind of greedy I mean, I, I just, I've not seen it. I don't think that's how anyone's getting ahead. Questions? Stun silence, huh? <laughs> Come on. I know how this goes. We wait until someone breaks the ice. Who's going to be first? Then they, and as I'm ready to go, they just shoot up. Please, thank you. Just a second, let's get a mic too, we can hear. Hi. Hi. Um, I look at the food industry as maybe a place where there's evil businessmen um, looking for profit versus excellence. Uh, how do you, or what's your opinion on that or I don't know. You know, it's interesting, we, are, we have a hospital affiliate in Decatur that's, uh, what else is in Decatur is Archer Daniel Midlands, and boy, you know, if there were bad guys in the food industry, it might be them. Um, and the report back is that it's just more ignorant than not. And I, I've got another story along those lines, but we also claim, came real close to the Cargill people. And uh, isn't, that, isn't that the right folks? Jimmy, who was it that the, the food people? Uh, the, uh, ConAgra. ConAgra. Yeah, look at their brands, you know? I mean, it's just like, it's a who's who of garbage food, right? And uh, they were devout CrossFitters and all paleo guys. And, and I, I don't know, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to impart evil to them because it wasn't, it wasn't there. It's, it's something weirder than that. And um, people get confused uh, when their bread is buttered in a certain direction, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's really strange. It does bizarre things to the intellect. But uh, we have a CrossFitter who was working for a, it was a, a young PhD, a molecular biologist, working for a uh, uh, pharmaceutical startup, that eventually got purchased in a big rain money kind of deal by uh, Merck, I believe it was. And he was sitting at a, at a, a, a video conference with the CEO of, of the pharmaceutical giant sitting there. And it was, it was prior to the thing starting, he was sharing with some people at the table, unaware that the conference feed was running, that he'd been doing Atkins, and he, he couldn't believe it, that his weight had come down, and his cholesterol had really improved, and he's got more energy, and, you know, and they're like, okay, well, anyways, back to what we're doing here. And Brad, that worked at the, at the pharmaceutical company, says, I mean, the, the weirdest things happen in, in pharmacy, because that's a, that's a weird thing for a, a guy that's head of a major pharmaceutical company to realize that, um, carbohydrate is indeed uh, a, a metabolic uh, issue, a problem. 
Um, it's something that every trainer here in the room knows or you're fairly ineffective as a trainer. Um, <laughs> sorry. A CrossFitter is about to take your clients. Um, but uh, it, it was weirder than that. Brad was talking about one of his first jobs he had was he was to babysit a, a, a hepatic oncoline. This was hepatic cancer in a, in a jar. What a cool thing, right? They got liver cancer in, in, a, in a Petri dish. And uh, it was a cool thing that they'd been able to develop this line because they could invent drugs to kill this cancer. Um, and once you could get it growing in a, in a jar. And, uh, and without having to test it on, on, on people or rats or rabbits. And, uh, and it, was, it was human uh, uh, liver cell that they were growing. And the guy tells him that, you know, Brad, here's the deal. You have to wash these things with pyruvate, like, constantly. And he's checked. And he goes, no, you don't understand. It's a very, very expensive cell line. And it was essentially with sugar, right? You've got to wash them constantly um, or, or, or they'll die. And he's, I got it. And he goes, no, but you don't understand, like, just about everyone that first inherits the line lets a bunch of it die because they just don't understand with the vigilance with which you have to be on these things. You've got you to stay here at night and wake up every half hour and, and wash these things with sugar or they'll die. And then Brad's like, cool, you've got to wash the liver cancer with sugar around the clock so it won't die so we can make dangerous drugs that'll kill it. Right? <laughs> All right. You know, I mean, I, that's kind of weird, right? Um, for CrossFitters, lesson to know, uh, onco cells have a seven times normal affinity for glucose. Yeah, cancer is a sugar hog. How do you like that? That was actually a title of a New England Journal, uh, New England Journal of Medicine article on the very subject of cancer and its affinity for glucose. But uh, I've quit attributing evil to uh, deadly ignorance. And uh, for no other reason than I just don't want to hate everyone in the food industry and government. And, you know, I just, <laughs> it, you, it gets too weird for you if, if you if you go there. I'd recommend you don't. Yeah, let's hope it's not that bad. But it, whether it's whether it's evil or ignorant, it is it is in some part ignorant. And uh, but you know, he, here's the thing: we don't want the world to change. We want to change the world. You get that? I don't want to hear tomorrow, and uh, I don't want to see tomorrow's New York Times. CrossFit right everyone else wrong. <laughs> we won't be able to we won't be able to get our fair share of what's left. You'll be drowning in imitators. Everyone wants, when everyone's doing CrossFit, we, we won't be doing anything. You know? And uh, we need that bad diet. And we need the ration of medicine. Why not? Let's take advantage of it. Obamacare helps you. Not non-CrossFitters, the CrossFitters. It does. It does. Yeah. We're going to ration medicine. You know what that's going to mean? What do you think? We're all going to get the best health care ever? What's that? You're going to have to do it yourself. Yeah, our doc says no spare parts, folks. Sorry. Heart went bad. You're dead. That's what it means. How would I finance it? I, you know, I, I wouldn't. Um, First of all, but but let me offer this: it's estimated a, a, a trillion dollar annual uh, uh, market, and by a whole bunch of different methods, you can come to the you can come to the realization that about 70 percent of it is spent on, and each of these is about 150 billion dollar um, industry, 150 billion splitting the chest for venous graft bypass, 150 bill, type two diabetes, 150 billion. Um, uh, 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 cholesterol meds, 150 billion. Hypertension, 150 billion. Obesity, 150 billion. I can get to three quarters of the budget on that if you reduce your carbohydrate intake and get off, most of it will go away. <laughs> so maybe in the end this will be a good thing. But here's how our doctors feel. They realize that they are lifeguards. And there are people out there, help, help, going down. And, and, and us CrossFit trainers, we're swim coaches. Now, when a guy's going down for the third time, I'm not going to give swim lessons. So I'm going to need to swim out there and get it. And, but what we're doing is we're teaching people how to swim so they don't need to call for the lifeguard. 
And boy, our docs get it. And boy, that really bothered them when I, when I kind of came up with that formulation. And so many of the lifeguards are tired of being lifeguards. Um, our doc says that I'll go 45 days or more without seeing someone who wasn't 30 years complicit in their demise. He says, I love it when they bring a little six-year-old girl off the freeway all He says, I get to be a doctor and do something heroic. And if I can bring her back and leave that day, I, I realize that's why I'm doing medicine. But he says, but when I'm working with Sally, who's, who's, who's at four foot nine and 400 pounds, bigger around than she is tall, we've cut off her feet, she's lost her eyes, she's to retinal myopathy, she's to peripheral artery disease, she's type two diabetic, I mean, we've done bypass surgery, stints. He goes, the hospital's made millions off of her. We just keep passing her back and forth to the nephrologist, radiologist, cardiologist, thoracic surgeon, internal medicine, back to the radiology department. We're all playing our games, and he says, it's organ derby that the pulmonologist does not want her dying of, 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 of pulmonary uh, function. Um, the nephrologist does not want the kidneys to go. The cardiologist does not want her heart to stop. And they're all given drugs that are screwing with the other people's organ systems. And sometimes there's damn near fist fights on what you gave my patient. You're going to make it look like her heart is what killed her. And then the pulmonologist will agree with the cardiologist. We're going to give her something that'll be toxic to her kidneys and we won't tell the nephrologist. <laughs> He says, never once have we sat down and thought, you know what, this poor woman is dying of a single cause. The etiology lies in this. She won't get off her She won't stop at the carbs. Please. Since I have the microphone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, so we were talking a little bit today about uh, different types of taxes, retail taxes and that kind of thing. And, uh, and I was just curious to know in your opinion, um, is our economy and regulatory environment truly friendly to businesses, or is there something else that we need to be doing to make it more conducive to, to people who want to be entrepreneurs or business people? When, when, when we incorporated and started to pay a, a corporate tax, um, very early it, t it turned out that the that the burden on the small business was far in excess of what we could, of what we could pay to 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 get by. That it was that it was fundamentally a, a, a limiting burden in the early stages. That we were were it not for the beauty of Mac and tax and going back and let's let's maybe we have these parameters wrong because it's saying I owe more than I've got and we're going to be able to get my hands on, and and um, I at once became a, a tax scufflaw. I mean I had to. It was it was it was tough. You couldn't you couldn't play by the rules and, and make it do. And the regulatory environment. Part of the reason that we left Santa Cruz is that um, there was a, a a block from the city council on the permitting of a, of a building that we had bought out in the sticks to use for a gym. And uh, it was a it, you know we, we've since now currently with the new mayor they've admitted that it was a that it was a, a that it was a political move. Um, and that the climate's different now, they assure us. But you know, I left I left Santa Cruz, California, because someone at city at the city council decided that CrossFit wasn't going to move into a bigger box. Yeah, I've uh, you know I I don't know of uh, any city, state, or federal government that's done a thing to help any of us. You know, maybe you have a, maybe you have a different experience. And what are the what are the costs to our efforts of the of the drag that is the you know business? I don't know. You know, I was talking. I was talking with uh, the folks at CrossFit Bellevue today, and the state of Washington has decided that the that the, the gym is a retail business. Jujitsu isn't. That's a philosophy. How do you like that? <laughs> um, and uh, yoga isn't either. That's also a philosophy. But CrossFit's like 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 selling. Uh, you know. It's a retail business, apparently. And by what logic? Does that seem fair to you? Does that seem right? It's absurd is what it is. Look, look government becomes my partner. It's, it, it, it's it, it, it directly proportionate to the, how much I'm taxed, right? And you know, one of the things I require of a partner, or an employee even, is a certain amount of intelligence, experience, you know, uh, uh, wisdom, something, some skill. 
And uh, so I see none of that in, my, in what I get from my government. And so maybe it must be taking care of people that are, that are unfortunate. Well, I'm, I'm all about that. I believe in that. Um, but uh, I also know that you lean on a business hard. And what happens, it feels to me, I mean, my sense of things is, is that all taxes fall disproportionately on the poor. Look, you know, I'm, I understand I'm wealthy now, right? It's, I found out from my president. I'm one of the wealthy Americans. And, but the truth is, is that I would be okay if you doubled, tripled, or quadrupled my tax. I would. I'd be okay. Um, one of the things I'd do is I would fix it in my take home. And my, I'd do the same for my staff. Now, somewhere or something, you know, I'm not going to take affiliate fees up either, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come from somewhere. And the most likely place is, is new job creation. That's the most likely place. You know, you tax an oil company. Who pays the tax? Does oil company? No, you do at the pump, right? And and who does that fall on? Who cares? Do you think I care? Do you think I, when I hit an intersection, I'm looking for the lowest price of the four intersections? No, I want the one with the cleanest bathroom and get me in and out quickest on my way. I don't look at the price. But I have been in a position before where the cost of gas made made it so that it made no sense for me to drive a car. It also didn't make it sense for me to have a family. And required that I put in 60 hours a week. I get that. No, the, the poor are the ones that, that get beaten up. In the end, we all pass it down. As far, if, you ever, if you can ever pass a tax on, you will, right? And you, you know, a bunch of you are trainers or business people here, you'll pass it on. Someone else will pay it. And who amongst your clientele will be hit hardest? The guy that can barely afford his training. And it's sad. It's sad. You know, I, I, uh, I can't help but see um, government, uh, surely there are people in need that are being helped. And there are also um, people that won't be helped but are being hurt uh, by, the, by the expanse of it. Are those views a surprise to anyone here? Sir. Um, can you uh, can you speak a little bit to um, the growth uh, of CrossFit and when you expect uh, like market saturation to occur? Um, and uh, I guess my question is kind of two part. And the the other part is, can you um, speak a little bit to the um, the affiliate model and the, some of the challenges that you face in protecting the brand of CrossFit? Yeah, um, I don't I don't know what saturation would look like. I, one of, one of my models for saturation. It, I, I, was, I was on the road forever on the seminar team, big smile from Nadia, and uh, we met the most wonderful people every time, everywhere we went, right? And I was like, God, pretty soon we're going to run out of wonderful people, I'm going to go to an event and there's going to be like half of these people are <laughs> and, and then I figured, like, we, we need to slow down on the seminars, because I don't want to bring a bunch of <laughs> into the community. And uh, I'm not growing this thing for growth's sake, it is growing. And I don't look at saturation much the way I wouldn't grow a tree in my yard and wonder how tall it's eventually going to get. Um, I, don't, I don't know what saturation would look like. I don't know if we're there. Or, but we've, we've played with numbers and uh, had some really interesting interaction with folks that do econometrics and, and, uh, and uh, 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 modeling of economies. And uh, I know we have an easy carrying capacity at 30,000 affiliates. That's, that's no big, big deal. I mean, be much of a, a scratch in the surface. But uh, um, it wouldn't take uh, uh, much for me to decide to stop taking new affiliates. You know, I don't have a plan to do that. But can I imagine circumstances where I say, we're good? Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. I'm not, if someone told me, dude, you're only going to have 20,000 affiliates someday, I don't care. 10,000, I don't care. I, I've mentioned several times today, I'm not an endpoint guy, I'm a process guy. And I, I don't, I'll make projections so people make me make guesses because they like projections. But uh, I don't think they have any predictive pow, pow, value or power. And uh, so, so I, I don't know. I just don't know. Um, the, the nature of the affiliate business is that they're kind of like, it's kind of like uh, uh, 
uh, Lutheran churches or Boy Scout troops or something where, you know, wherever you can gather 150 people interested, um, you've got an affiliate. And, and your carrying capacity for a small box and a single operator comes somewhere between 150 and 200 people. That's all you're gonna, all you're gonna be able to handle. And so I asked myself in, in, a, in a community of 100,000 people, how many groups of 150 are there that are willing to work out hard? That is determined by the trainers that put this together and find them. And it is not a, it is not a feature contained within the demographic or the community itself. Do you understand that? And so there are towns where, no, where there is no need for CrossFit, and the right trainer in there is going to be booming. I mean, look at what the, look at what the uh, Martins did at, uh, in Ramona. There was a period when, uh, back when uh, Rob Wolf had CrossFit Chico, and he told me, here's why, here's why I'm having such a hard time with the business. Chico is so small that there's just, there's just you're never going to have the success that you have. And I'm like, dude, well, Santa Cruz is as small as Chico. And we're crushing it. He goes, that's a different thing. That's because that's the first one ever. I'm like, well, you're the third one ever. I mean, it shouldn't be <laughs> that big a deal. But he, but he actually had me somehow convinced that there was something inherently wrong with Chico. Then I went out to Ramona, where the Martins were. And Ramona's a town that, that like, there's nothing there at all. But every three years, the nothing that's there burns down. And <laughs> this was one of the years. <coughs> where nothing burned to the ground. And we're driving through nothing, the part that didn't burn, and then we get to the part where it all burned, and then it's a dirt road, and we get to the Martins, and they got an open house, and it's opening day, and they got 100 new members, you know? And I was like, wow. And so I tried, went to use my phone, but it didn't work, because there's no cell in Ramona. <laughs> and so I got to use a landline, and I called Rob Wolf, and I go, dude, it's not the population. <laughs> no, that's, that's not it. It has nothing to do with the number of people in the town. Um, it's also not being the first CrossFit in town. I told the story today of a guy from Wyoming. I'm so excited to be the first affiliate in Wyoming. He told me it's going to be a cold winter in Wyoming. Um, you don't want to be the only affiliate. You'll, you'll find out why you're the only affiliate. And everyone you talk to is like, what the hell is CrossFit? You know, that's what happens. Here's what we've found. Um, the lag time to solvency from, from you know, opening the door to, to, to breaking even is density dependent. And so today in San Diego, where we got a boatload of affiliates, you will open your doors to a crowd waiting. Isn't that a trip? So saturation, I'm not sure what it looks like, but I, I know we're not there. The climate's getting better and better and better. And it, it, it may not happen. I also know that the population um, is, is growing faster in numbers than, than, uh, than uh, CrossFit is. And uh, not as a percent, but our numbers are so low. No, I, I, think, I, think, I think we're in pretty good shape there. Defense of the brand, boy, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, a couple of fronts that are interesting. One is we've got a, we've got a wonderful battle going on at, uh, at the risk retention group. And uh, any RRG members here? Yeah. It's a, it's a heck of a deal. Um, I realized long ago that someone was going to figure out that you could go to a CrossFit gym and do a workout and go home and have some pizza, drink some beer, get up in the morning and go into an emergency room and walk through the doors and fold over. And, and all you have to be able to do is say, CrossFit, CrossFit, I worked out, I'm dying. Something like that. <laughs> CrossFit, CrossFit, help me, I'm dying. <laughs> they're going to draw blood and they're going to see that your CKs are through the roof. And since you're doubled over, obviously, in agony, they're going to admit you to the hospital. They very likely will put you in ICU. And here's the therapy. See if you can deal with this. They're going to push IV into you, fluids into you, and turn the TV on. And you get to chit sit there and watch Oprah and order ice cream. <laughs> if you can do that for two or three days, you can make 350 grand. And I've been long worried that someone's going to figure that out. So I said, you know what, we got to self-insure. What we watched is we watched in the McKimba Mims case. This is an affiliate that unaffiliated, then promptly gave a client, McKimba Mims, rhabdo. Well, McKimba had, was permanently injured from this. He'd also run like a 17-minute 5K uh, during this period of permanent injury. 
And uh, yeah, in court, he, his, in his deposition, he said that he was so, that he couldn't go to the mall with his wife anymore. And I was like, oh, I got that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, how messed up are you that we can't get you to the mall? I mean, that's too, right? put you on something with wheels and we'll go to the mall if that's your thing. It was complete nonsense. Complete nonsense. And the insurance company agreed it's complete nonsense and they folded, they rolled over. Because it was cheaper for them to just lay down for this thing than it was to keep fighting. And I said, uh oh, we have a huge problem on the horizon. And we founded the risk retention group. Here's the RRG group's attitude. I'll spend 10 million of my money to keep some from getting 50,000 because he sat in a hospital and ate green jello on a plastic spoon and watched Oprah for three days. Ain't gonna happen. And it's not that it makes sense in the, in, the, in, the, in the instance, but it's the marginal cost of yielding to a suit that's gonna invite a class action. And so let's roll this forward. Guy in Texas, Decides he's going to go to a CrossFit workout for the first time. He swings by and picks up his buddy. And they go to a CrossFit gym. And they do the workout. They go out that night boozing it up. He wakes up in the morning and he's got to go to the ER. He's folded over in pain. CrossFit, CrossFit, help me, I die. They draw his blood. And the affiliate's getting sued. And it's, it's so cool because the affiliate's a member of the risk retention group. Ain't going to work. Let me share with you one of the things we found out in just doing the thorough work that we do. Home Slice that decided to go to the gym, his buddy that he picked up, check this out, his buddy that he picked up just happens to be a very successful rhabdo attorney. Who would have thought of going through the deposition and just Googling everyone in there's name? Yeah. So think of how, think of how what bad luck he has. You go to pick up your rhabdo buddy attorney, and you go to the gym and you work out, and, you, and then you go booze it up with him, and in the morning you got rhabdo, and you thank God you got an attorney friend, huh? Isn't that perfect? <laughs> not gonna fly. It's not gonna fly. We're going, to, we're going to ride this thing out until pretty soon some litigator, some law firm, is gonna realize that this is not good economics. That these are willing to spend 10 million to keep us from getting 50,000. We've been effed. <laughs> and then they're gonna wanna settle, I ain't gonna settle. I'm gonna make this extremely expensive. And we're gonna prove the point along the way. By the way, we have had, we had, we had an affiliate install a pull-up bar that broke and hurt someone we paid. Yeah, you messed up pull-up bar, screwed this guy up to it. That's what insurance is for. But it's not so you can go to the hospital and eat cream jello off a plastic spoon, watch Oprah, and get rich. That's not what it's for. So that's one place where we're, where we're, we're committed, strong. Um, I'm not going to let litigators pick you off one at a time from the outside. It ain't going to happen. Unless you're not in the RG. No, I say, we always had like someone not in the RG is get eaten alive in front of everyone so you can see what the RG is about. <laughs> it's gonna happen. One of you not in the risk retention group. How many here not in the risk retention group but got insurance? Show your hands, come on. There's only a few of you do, don't lie to me. Yeah. Let me tell you what your insurance company will do to you if you ever get in a bind. Nothing. They'll settle. They'll admit to anything. It'll look, it'll look professionally like you suck, like you hurt someone and had to pay. But they'll, they'll be okay, and then they'll probably cancel you after that. No, you need, a, you need an insurance company that's, that's here. You own the risk retention group. I seeded it with $150,000 of my own money in cash that I didn't have, borrowed. Didn't have it, but got it. And I paid for all the actuary and the, and the work with the state of Montana. I did all of that because I got to protect my affiliates. That's, why, that's, that's what I do. That's who I am. That's my job. I got to make sure that things like this don't happen to you. Another front, um, just blatant theft. We had a federal judge yesterday in, uh, where's Dale? You hear Dale? Was that yesterday? Uh, day before. Day before yesterday, a judge in federal court in San Diego issued an injunction against uh, XFIT supplements um, 
to, uh, cease and desist, immediate, done. Can't do that anymore. What's cool is that it's in a related category, but this bodes very well, I would say, counselor, for those in our category, which is another XFIT, guys. You know, like XFIT has nothing to do with CrossFit. It's not even related. And so, yeah, that's what, a railroad Xing or a railroad crossing, the sign, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's done to confuse, it's leaning on the mark, it's infringing on your rights, and we're going to stop it. We're going to stop it. We won in South Africa. We beat that guy back. Um, we have litigation pending. What, what, Dale, what's the, what's the tally? Give the quick story on that. How many cases? Yeah, what are, you, what are you guys doing in legal? Nothing? Just sitting around the house? Working on my That part, that part of success is a surprise. That's weird, isn't it? Do you have to do that? What else? Stand up and yell it out. Come on, brother. You know, I think it's an interesting thing. It's the Trojan pit bull, if you will, um, to mix <laughs> metaphor with one of our favorite beasts. Um, it, it, it's, it's not going to work out so well for the golds. And uh, the, the affiliate is internal to the global gym is no threat to a freestanding affiliate. And to the way I see it, none at all. It would mean nothing to me. But here's what's going to happen. Look, they're going to have to send someone to a level one, and they're going to be a trainer. And they're going to be working in the Gold's Gym model, which means that um, half or more of what they earn is going to be taken. And they're going to become increasingly popular because all the guys doing this are going to look over at the people doing Fran and go, you know what? I look like an idiot. <laughs> That's what happens, especially when I do this. <laughs> Two guys lateral raising going, why are those guys over there laughing at us doing this? You know? <laughs> and his buddy goes, because you look like an idiot. I'm going over there. And, and pretty soon the question becomes, why am I in here in a, in a, where, where, I'm, where the review is mixed? Um, the equipment I would like and need isn't here. And there's too much glass all around. I mean, it's, that's kind of a horrible thing. What, what isn't windows is, is glass. You ever seen it? You ever seen a 135-pound one hop into mirror? I have. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's just a lot about it that's not right. But the thing that really sucks is taking half of my earnings. And what happens is that those people end up. Um, I've seen them go to alleys. I've seen them go to parks. I've seen them go to their garages. And I've seen trainers leave and take the entire Gold's Gym staff with them. And uh, it's uh, the good training will chase out the bad. And the, see, see, the Gold's Gym is entirely dependent on the subscription model. And this is, this is business as usual um, globally for, for big gym business. And it's this oversubscription model. And what it looks like is that the super successful gyms, about 80% of the active membership haven't been to the gym in the past six months. That's the goal. It's not just what happens, it's what you want to happen. So I, in my last Gold's Gym, one morning, Sunday, bright and early, grabbed Alex Zabo, and I go, Alex, check this out, dude. You're not going to believe it. It's Sunday morning. There's 31 people here, and every single one of them are my client. He looks around. He goes, yeah, come with me. He takes me in the office, shuts the door. He goes, good job. He says, uh, they love you. I go, I know. He goes, I hate them. <laughs> My people? He goes, yeah, I fucking hate them. <laughs> I'm like, what did they do? He goes, they're in here every day. They're crowding the gym. They're using up all the soap, the hot water, the towels. You guys, if I, I, 400 more of you and I'm out of business. He goes, let me show you what I like. And he reaches back, and I'll never forget it. He had this, that faux marble five by seven card file. It's like it has the same pattern on it that your lab book had in chem class. That black and white modeled fake marble thing, right? You with me? He's got one of those. And it's full of cards. I mean, it's, it's you know, there's nine inches of stuff going on here. I go, what's that? And he goes, look, and he pulls out a card and it's a, it's a membership card. And I'm like, I don't get it. He goes, it's a PIF. I knew what that was. That's a paid in full. I go, what do you mean? He goes, she never came back and got her card. He goes, I love these people. 
<laughs> and he's got thousands of people that paid the $350 and got their picture taken and never came back. And I was like, oh, whoa. Tell you what, I quit bragging right then about check out all my people out here. We're in entirely different businesses. As a trainer, when your clients don't come, you don't get rich, you go broke. But in business as usual, Global Gym, Gymville USA, you want everyone to sign up and stay home. And you're a stupid middleman, too. You're not doing the training, you're not delivering the, 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 the health. The trainers are, or the people are doing it on their own. How's that for a crazy, how's that for a messed up model? How much pride can you have? How'd you like to make the world's best burgers, but no one eats them, we just throw them away? <laughs> Is there any way to have pride in a business where, where the business model depends on the overwhelming majority of the people that avail themselves of your service, deriving no value from it whatsoever? Is that attractive to anyone here? It's not to me. Sir? CrossFit for hope. Um, you know, St. Jude took ALS from a 94% fatality rate to a 94% survival rate, and they show that survival change graphed against dollars spent on the cure. And I looked at that and I go, man, I gotta, I gotta be in that space. And I got no end point. But I tell you what, I would like to keep supporting them in their efforts until there isn't a powerful causal relationship um, that they can demonstrate between the money they spend and the lives they save. And uh, it was an interesting thing to talk about endpoint and process again. Um, the Hope people, we, we told them, we're going we're gonna to do a workout and raise money for you guys. And they said, that's awesome. They were so, so pleased. And uh, they asked, how much money are you going to raise? I go, what do you mean, how much money am I going to raise? As much as I can. And they go, well, how much? I go, what? Like, Jimmy's like, well, they need to know. And I go, what do you mean they need to know? Like, are they going to spend it before we get it? Or what? <laughs> So I was looking around, I flipped on their website, and I found that it costs $1.7 million a day just to keep the doors open. That's the overhead. And I thought, I got a cool idea. Let's see if we can all work together and buy them a day. All right? And uh, so we all got together, and guess what? We bought them a day, $1.7 I mean, what was it, Jimmy? What was the end point? It was? How, how much did we raise? Yeah. I think it was $1.698. Ah, it came up a little short. <laughs> it wasn't a goal. They asked me to make a projection. I just got lucky, stupid lucky. That's all it was. It had no predictive value. There was no, nothing, nothing about that number and what happened. Nothing. It just luck, okay? But here's the thing. I thought it was funny that it was so close to the 1.7, but I suppose it had been 800,000, where I've been half as happy. No, I'd have been perfectly happy. 400,000. I don't care. Whatever. We got some money. I mean, it's good. It's money they didn't have before. 7 million. Same thing. I don't care. But I'll tell you what. Um, we did 1.7 um, last year. I'm going to be pissed off if you don't do better than that this year. <laughs> I'm a process guy. I want, I want to do better. I want to do more, and I want to do it again. And if it's next year, it's $2 million, that'll be great. It's better. You know, if it's eight, that'll be great, too. I really don't, I really don't know. I don't have answers to that. It's like the saturation question. I don't, I, don't have, I don't have, my crystal ball doesn't do that kind of thing. What my crystal ball tells me is what, what processes are, are beneficial. And I know that supporting the cause of catastrophic children's illness and injury is, is, is worth doing on the face of it. Uh, same thing with Kenya. You know, Sevi asked me on film, why are we here? And I go, because we can afford to be here. You know, why are we helping? Because we're in a position to help. That's it. And, and I don't ha expect to ever have to explain to anyone why it is that a little two-year-old girl should have a clean glass of water as opposed to one that someone pissed in. Right? I mean, those are basics. Those are basics. And a miracle happened on, on the way to Kenya and on the way back. And it was really interesting that we, we ended up 12 hours from home, 12 time zones away. And so it's, it's midnight, you know, here. It's noon there. And you realize you just can't get farther away. And in one of our many trips in a short period of time, we did find ourselves on one occasion stuck. And uh, I was ready to go home, go home in a big way. When you, when you go out and, and hang out in the Mombasa and the, and the surrounding regions, it's a it's, it's hugely um, emotional experience. It's, it's wonderful and it's horrible all at once. And when you're ready to go home, you're really, really ready to go home like a few places you've ever been. 
but you come away with something really special, really important, and I and invite all of you to make that trip, and we're gonna make that increasingly possible for everyone to do. But I told the guy, I go, I can't, just what's the farthest way you can get me? Because I realized that being as far away from home as I possibly could, the farthest thing I could get would get me pretty close to home. And so we did, we just get me as far away from here as you possibly can, I and mean, we made that trip. But here's what happens at home. You realize that, that as far away from home as you can possibly get, you just made a profound difference, and a very simple, very wonderful, elegant difference, something marked by its simplicity and its efficacy. And you can't help but notice right away if that I can do that there, I can do that anywhere, and I can really do something cool in my neighborhood. And that has been the experience of the affiliates that have looked into this. I mean, it's, it's crazy powerful to realize that you and your box mates can make a profound difference, a quality of life difference in the last generations, 12,000 miles away, in a place unlike any place you've ever been or will ever go, that is on an order of a thing. It's like Marty Say said, that it's a, it's a it's an opportunity so rich that it becomes an obligation. And it's hugely empowering. I mean, you realize that you guys can do anything. And what does it take? What, was the, what, was, what did it take to make a multi-generational difference for a village of three or 400 children to give them actually enough? See, you build a school. I mean, you know, education isn't just education in Africa. In rural Africa, education is the difference between dying at 40 years old in a cornfield or leaving to be 65 and perhaps owning an automobile and living in a house someday. School makes the difference. School. If you don't get to the university, you're going to die in the cornfields in your, on your feet. One of our contacts there told us in just the most beautiful ac accent that every, every Kenyan child is born under a death sentence. And it's, you're going to die on your feet in the cornfields when you're 40 unless you get to the university. So the, academic interest of the students is like nothing I've ever seen. Kids in rural Kenya study like I've never seen kids in the States study before. They're fighting for their lives. They know. Pass the test or die. And when we build them a school, get them out of the dirt, get them sitting at a desk. You know how lousy a desk your lap is, right? You know what a pencil on cheap paper is like in your lap? We get them at a desk, we put them in a school, it's got a roof, but the beauty of this is the roof collects water. And the tragedy of, of rural Africa is that women are engaged full time in the portage of water. They are, they are a replacement for plumbing. And there's a full time occupation, 20 kilometers each way to go get water. And the water they get is fetid, rotten, horrible. It's, it, they told us, they go, you drink that, it'll kill you. And I'm looking at him, yeah, I wouldn't drink it. He goes, yeah, but it would kill you. And I go, I believe you. He goes, no, I'm telling you. Look, I mean, dude, you drink that, you will die. Kills us in 25 years, but you'd die right, right, right now. You just croak if you drink that. <laughs> it looks like you'd die. <laughs> Can you? Water doesn't flow like that in our gutters. Water doesn't flow like that in our gutters, and they drink it. The cow over there pissing in the water is a guy washing a motorcycle. There's three kids taking a bath and a woman collecting water to drink, all in the same pool half the size of this room. We build a school, we bring fresh water, and it's a multi-generational difference. In one afternoon, you can put the money together in a single workout to do that. And in the HOPE workout that we just did, we got enough money for, what, 35 schools? 30 schools? Just under 30 schools. Just under 30 schools. That's 30 times three or 400 children they are going to have clean water <laughs> through the dry season. What's that worth? Easily in the afternoon of me and my knucklehead buddies doing a workout, right? Yeah. That's the goal. We're just going to keep just doing those things. What else? I'll take one more. Yeah, one more question. Right there was first. We'll take two more. We'll take two more. It was a tie. I just have two questions. One. Ah. <laughs> Everybody You're wants done. to know the answer to yeah. this one. one. What advice would you give for um, affiliate owners? In this room, there are lots of veteran and rookie affiliate owners, but we've all seen the progress that CrossFit has. 
nowadays, what advice would you give to owners and the second, probably more important of the two? Um, who's going to win the CrossFit Games this year, male and female? <laughs> in what? Who's going to win the CrossFit Games this year, in your opinion? <laughs> I don't think I can do that. Imagine how they pick someone you never heard of and then they won. Yeah. I, yeah, um, I would have been wrong with my initial pick, so I, no, I don't know. I don't know. And believe me, too, when I tell you that I don't care. Um, the fittest person in the world is going to win. That's the part that really matters to me. And uh, I've, got, I've got favorites all up and down the ranks. You know, I've just got uh, so many of the athletes are so special to us that uh, this reminds me of. Uh, I, I, really, I, used, I really used to enjoy the UFC until we had three or four occasions where uh, both fighters on the card were mine. And that's just like, this is going to be a lousy night, you know? Someone I love is going to just be so unhappy. And uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What was the other question? No, advice for Kelly Yeah, my advice is for, is for the, the new people. The old ones, my advice would be don't listen to anyone. And, and, you know, create your own truth. You know what you're doing, and you're doing it well. Um, but for the for the new people, and I and I had someone just today that said, I, I asked you when you first started, what, what what should I do? What's going to make or break me? And I said, you know, just love your clients like you could love no one else. And he says, hey, we're on our third buck since you told me that. So I'm like, yeah, you know, you love them. He goes, I love the hell out of them. Yeah, of course you do. Um, that's what really matters. That you care. And if you can find yourself. Um, you know, you got a 65-year-old gal who does her very first pull-up right before your eyes, and she's crying like a baby. And if you tell her, hey, knock it off, you're making me look bad, um, <laughs> you're a different guy than if you tear up, too, and you look around, and the rest of the people in the room are crying. I mean, if you, can, if you can care about people at that level, if that's just the natural you, and you enjoy human performance and human movement and exercise, and you're one of those people that thought the coolest part of school was PE, um, you've got all you need to really do very, very well in this business. And, but similarly, if you're like, yeah, so what, the old bag got to pull up, you know, I only work with the athletes, um, you, you're not going to do very well. You're not going to do very well. And you're, you're, you're going to have financial troubles, too. <laughs> yeah, you, you got to make it fun, and you got to do it with a lot of love, and you got to put the clients above yourself, and you've got to uh, fully wrap yourself around the enormous... Uh, potential that you have to make people's lives better. And here's what's so cool. They get to decide what better means. You don't have to. Tell someone that comes to you, I'm going to make your life better. It's weird how that happens, but here's what I want you to do. Go home tonight. You're starting on, on tomorrow morning. I want you to go down tonight, and I want you to write down all those things that would make you a better person. It could be weird shit. Stuff about being a mom, being a dad, being a husband, uh, being a boss, more pull-ups, you know, bigger biceps, whatever you want. Write it down. Just things that you think would really make you better. And hide it. Don't let me see it. Don't tell me about it. Keep it to yourself. And six months after we're rolling together, I want you to go home and I'm, I'm open that thing and, and hey, how are we doing? And I'm going to tell you, we're going to have a perfect score. Fold it back up, don't tell me. I bet I know. There's, there's nothing in your clients' lives that, your, that exposure to you and our training stimulus isn't going to make them, yeah, it's better. It's just my life's better. I'm a better person. And it's crazy the things they come up with. Maladies that aren't there, emotional things that are fixed, bad relationships that get ended, uh, ones that were in distress that get fixed. I mean, it's just, we've all heard those stories, right? I tell me affiliates, I know what you do for a living. I understand what you do for work. I know that you have the gal that lost 100 pounds. I know you got the guy in remission from cancer. I know you got the gal that couldn't get up and down the steps of her condo, and now she can without holding the rail. I know what you're talking about. You got the guy that was hit by the car and was told that he would never walk again, and he's back in the gym, right? I mean, these, you hear this, and we all nod, and like, man, it's going on everywhere. There's a whole lot of healing going on, a whole lot of healing going on. And we're ending in an era now where, again, I want you to know the goal is not to convince the world that they're doing it wrong and you're doing it right, but it's to help as many people as you can. And then the marketing that takes place, the only effective marketing that ever takes place for any service business or any, really, any business is that your clients won't shut up about what's happened to them in your care. <laughs> I had clients tell me, you know what, my wife says she doesn't want to hear about CrossFit anymore, and the guys at work say, i got to stop talking about what should I do. And I'm like, oh, don't be a Wear them down. You keep them down. <laughs> Be abusive. Call them names. Try something, you know? 
And if people ask me, what's this CrossFit thing? We would be, I'd say, look, senior CrossFit staff at a gas station. Someone's got a CrossFit sticker in a car. A guy pumping gas goes, what's CrossFit? We all run. You know I, mean? I, don't, I don't know where to start. But you know what? It's hard, isn't it? Affiliates, you have trouble talking about it. I do. It's kind of hard, right? Well, uh, you know, but you know what? Your clients have no problem. They won't shut up about it. And they're doing marketing. Uh, by the way, marketing in our world, marketing is anything you do to improve the attempt to improve the bottom line that isn't directly improving the product or service. It's the fuchsia flyers under the windshield wipers at the mall, it's the Groupon, and it's your clients bragging about how wonderful you are. But it isn't, it isn't, it isn't something that I think you should be engaged in. Affiliates, don't market. Brand. Let the community know who you are and what you are. Share with them your identity. Let them know about all the healing that's happening at your house. It's okay to knock on doors and tell people that you've got, you've got a solution to blood pressure, but that's not marketing, that's branding, that's, brand, that's identity. Now, I wouldn't recommend you do that, but it does, it does make a certain kind of sense where flyers under the windshield wipers and Groupon makes no sense at all. No, you, Here's the, here's, the, here's the irony of, of training, um, is that only clients can get clients, but the bummer is, is that when you don't have clients, you wonder, how the hell am I going to get clients? I don't know how to get that first client, but I know that the, first, the second one will come from the first, and you've got to get started. And it, most everyone can find some way to get several people started. And what you have to do is give them so much and do so much for them that they bring the rest in. And what's very interesting is that in every client tree, and it happens this way in every service business, very early in your business, there's someone that becomes the father of 80% of your clientele. This guy got someone who got someone who got five, who each got four, who it looks like a, a network marketing dream. You know, it came out of this. There's someone in your client base that's uh, disproportionately influential and has a significant tree under them. And you just keep working for those people. There's some maven out there that's going to find this thing, and they're going to say things about you and your training that you could never say. And it's entirely credible from, from the clients and from no one else. We got yes. the, sorry. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Uh, uh, would you speak to us on your, uh, your process, your personal process, of becoming an entrepreneur? And as you uh, mentioned, uh, don't listen to the masses, so to speak. And uh, you've done something what most entrepreneurs do not do, and you've created a business that not only uh, aspires to attract clients, but aspires to attract them. Yeah. That's a uh, model that does that is not common. Let me, let me give, a, for instance, with some actual numbers. Our estimation was that uh, um, somewhere through next year, the CrossFit ecosystem, that is all money spent on things CrossFit, through affiliates, that's where we made the estimation from. It's interesting, because I took two or three approaches that I came up with, and we have a, 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 a big tech partner that has also dabbled with how many, what, how big is the CrossFit ecosystem. And here's, here's, and it was interesting that we came up with almost identical numbers by very different methods. But um, CrossFit did $50 million last year on an ecosystem we estimate to be about a billion dollars strong, all right? And, and from and our projections from June of last year to the end of 2013 that this uh, uh, will be a hundred million dollar CrossFit Inc. on two and a half billion dollars of, of uh, uh, total ecosystem. But what's interesting there is that we double in our revenue, but our market share falls from five percent to four. And I'm telling you all as well, that's exactly what should happen. We're well, our share of the pie. Our, sorry. Our slice of pie is growing, but our share of the pie is slowly diminishing. And, and, I, and I believe that to be the true path. Um, we call it the least rents model. And you can draw a pie, and I'm not going to bother you with this, you can see it. You can make a big circle with a slice of pie. Here's what we're doing at HQ. We're doing everything we can to grow the entire pie while keeping our chunk constant or shrinking. Okay? And why? Because the community is best served by us doing that. I could give you a single action that would give me 60 million extra dollars next year. Single action. And I can come up with a lot of single actions that would do things like that. Here's one. 
Next license agreement that goes out the door requires that you use CrossFit branded gear. There. What that does to Rogue Fitness in the space of four to five years, it takes a $60 million a year company and it makes it where I could buy it for $5 million because they'd have nothing left four years later. Their business is entirely dependent, not on existing gyms, but new gyms. <laughs> Once you get all your you're pretty good for a while, right? <laughs> buy a couple extra bars or a rower and you expand slowly. But Bill and Katie, the Henningers, Rogue makes their money from the new box growth. And we could take that from them. I, Find no shortage of MBAs that tell me you'd be stupid not to do that. In fact, our battle with Anthos was in no small part over exactly that part of the plan. Now, what happens? So I get $60 million extra next year, but what happens to my community? Well, first of all, Bill and Katie are destroyed, pillars of my community. Um, who's going to get the equipment to the regionals next year? Oops, Bill and Katie, ain't, they're going out of business. They can't afford it. They, the games cost them. They spend four or five million out of their own pocket in the games every year. You think they're going to do that while we're eating their lunch? Destroying their company? No. And so what would I get to the games? How do I, in 19 locations, bring a million pounds of equipment to each? How do I do that? I'll tell you how, by putting substandard shit out there. I'd have no choice, really. I'm arrogant enough to think that my friends and I could one day eventually run an Fitness, a, a, an equipment company as good as Rogue. I believe we could. I also think it'd take five to seven years to get to the point that Bill and Katie are currently at. In the meantime, what's going to happen is I'm going to have affiliates buying a whole bunch of stuff that isn't as good as what they can currently get for more money than they used to get so that I can make more money. I've damaged a, an essential part of my community. I'm shrinking the circle and widening my slice of the pie. You get that? I can do the same game with supplements too. Make a whole lot of money. Not going to do it not going to do it. Those are outside of our expertise. Those are opportunities that belong to other people. I don't want to be in the supplement business. That doesn't mean I hate you for being in it. Good luck to you. Be in it. Fine. I'm not going to be in the supplement business. I'm not going to be in the equipment business. Those are opportunities that are best left for others. My job is to grow the pie. I want to see anyone that's involved with CrossFit in the supplement business. I'd like to see them successful. But you will determine that, not me. I didn't pick Bill and Katie, the Henningers, and Rogue to be successful. What'd they do? They produced better equipment at a better price than anyone else could, and by far. And they're, they're supporting the games, the same reason your gyms are full of their stuff, right? Because they make the good shit. I mean, it's just that easy. And I'm going to work to protect them, not trying to take what they want. By the way, this notion of taking a larger slice of pie regardless of the effect on the pie, shrinking it or with disregard for its growth. There's a name for that in the economic world, and it's called rent seeking. And I don't like rent seekers. I don't like business activity that doesn't create value or wealth. <clears throat> and if you're not making the world better, if you're not offering a better product and a better service, then I just assume you went off somewhere and got out of business. Because you're not good for the rest of us, you're not good for the community, you're not good for the world, you're not good for anybody, you're not good for business, you're not good for the business, the reputation of businessmen and businesswomen anywhere. This is my problem with MBAs. Sorry, folks. It's why the MBA oath was written. Anyone familiar with the book? You gotta look at it. You gotta look at it. It's important work. Business is ethical enterprise. It sure can be. There's something beautiful about providing you attractive opportunities for other people. You know what it does? It creates wealth. And it, over the ages, it makes a difference between working an 80-hour work week, a 60-hour work week, a 40-hour work week. It, it's how, in, in, in the space of several generations, you can end up in poverty having things that only the rich and the wealthy could have had three generations ago, four generations ago. It's amazing. But we're all in this to grow the pie. And I catch anyone trying to take, take more pie without growing a thing, and you become my enemy. One of the ways this happens is to get uh, uh, VC funded. Sorry, but when a vendor takes a relationship with venture capital, I find that my relationship with you changes quickly. Even when I don't want it to, it's going to. The short-term requirements of venture capital and private equity are not at all conducive to what any of us are doing. I'm not trying to maximize my rate of return. I'm trying to maximize the healing. 
We're trying to get as many people moving correctly and eating right and enjoying the benefits of the lifestyle that we espouse. That's the business we're in. And it's through doing that and supporting one another that we're gonna make money. And it's crazy how much money we're making. It's our sense of things that by far the overwhelming majority of trainers making a six-figure income today are CrossFit trainers. I worked in the, in the traditional environment forever. Making $100,000 a year is nearly impossible. Nearly impossible. I don't care how good you are, how popular you are, it's almost impossible. Thank you. You have no idea how much I love you and how much how grateful I am for your support. I've learned a lot from you. And the biggest lesson for me, for staff, has been that uh, um, leadership happens from the rear as often as from the front. And that we lead because you've given us um, th that opportunity. And it's an opportunity, like in Kenya, it's an opportunity so rich that it's become an obligation. And we're committed to you a thousand percent. We have no aspirations as a corporation, me personally, for my legacy, for my estate, for my children's well-being, um, or for the cause of fitness and health globally that doesn't ultimately depend, rest on the affiliate's shoulders. So don't screw it up. <laughs> Thank you. Well, did you enjoy that? It's good stuff. Hey, I'm Jonathan Bechtel. I'm the president of the Freedom Foundation. And just on behalf of, um, of all of us, uh, we appreciate you being here tonight. We appreciate Greg and his crew taking the time to come out. Would you give them one, one more round of applause? Just want to mention a couple of things for on your way out. Um, we, uh, just in the spirit of CrossFit, we put together, uh, with the help of one of the box owners, a special workout of the day um, for you to, to try out tomorrow or, or whenever you're ready for it. It's on, uh, on the back of the program. We've got our web address. You can jump on there, check it out, uh, do it, uh, upload your times, and uh, use it as a way to connect with us. Also, as you walk out, um, the registration tables, we've got uh, t-shirts if you'd like to commemorate the event, and also information about the Freedom Foundation and what we do to try to protect those free markets and that freedom to create uh, that Greg talked about. And also, lastly, if you're a student um, at the University of Washington, just want you to know, uh, mention what, what Rebecca said before, that we have actually an on-campus club here to talk about these kinds of ideas, to bring in people like Greg, to just uh, bring some different perspectives and to give you an opportunity uh, to see uh, maybe some new ways to, to, uh, to look at some of these things. Uh, it's called the Student Freedom Project. We're on Facebook. We're online. There's information in, uh, in the program. We'd love to have you be a part of that um, here at the campus. So again, thank you uh, for, for coming out tonight. Thank you for what you do to make our community stronger uh, and to give us all um, some hope for the future. Have a great evening.